Hey, this is Benjamin. We're back for another virtual IoT meetup. I think this has been uh, maybe more than two weeks this time, but I'm actually very excited about today's meetup. Uh, we have Katarina and Marcin from uh, an initiative you may have heard about, uh, especially if you follow um, TED Talks or in general, you may have heard about open source ecology. Um, I won't spoil uh, Marcin and Katarina presentation, so we'll hear all about um, what open source ecology is and what's more um, a recent initiative they, they've been working on uh, around uh, housing more specifically. Um, just a quick um, yeah, announcement uh, as always regarding questions. We will be taking questions on Twitter. Uh, feel free to tweet using the virtual IoT hashtag. You can also comment on meetup.com. I was uh, just talking to Marcin and, and, um, and Katarina and uh, yeah, uh, we would all be very happy if you ask questions along the presentation so as we can make this um, meetup slash webinar very interactive. So without further ado, uh, I think we have uh, some, some great uh, um, slides that Martin and Katarina will, will go through so as we learn all uh, more about what cool stuff they're working on um, in the middle of nowhere, Missouri, as you guys uh, <laughs> said, uh, right? So um, guys, it's up to you. Feel free to start whenever you want. Okay. Hi, everyone. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Benjamin. So I'll start with open source ecology, then Katarina will move on to the culmination of all that work and application to the housing part, the Open Building Institute. So for now, let me talk about open source ecology, the history, how this project started, a little bit about it, where we are and where we're going, just to cover the basis. And follow the most frequent updates we post on Facebook, so facebook.com open source ecology. That's the best way to follow the work, that's the most regular. And um, we'll start right here. So if you haven't seen the TED Talk, there's, there's a good overview TED Talk on the Global Village. I'll start sharing my screen here, get into my presentation. Let's screen share here. Share this and let me know if there's any issues or anything like that. So going into the presentation mode. And I'll start with a little bit of background about myself. So, and the Global Village construction set. So it's different industrial machines that it takes to make a modern civilization with modern comforts. It's a construction set. It's an open source platform for designing and building these tools to enable uh, lower barriers to entry to all kinds of manufacturing and so forth. An open platform to make the world better. So let me tell you a little bit about it. We're focusing on open source hardware, and there's open, there's open IoT in there as well. But open source hardware, because it's so tangible and, and important to us. And why did Ajek? Well, it goes back to my history, and I'll start way back. I mean, I was born in Poland, so just a little bit about me. And um, at that time, so my, you know, it's a small country in the middle of some powerful neighbors. We have a long history of war. and my grandparents, for example, my grandfather was in a Polish underground derailing, derailing German supply trains. My grandmother was in a concentration camp. And when I left Poland in 1982, this is a scene that I've seen on my streets. This is not a parade. It's the real times behind the Iron Curtain, times of material scarcity. So I thought a lot about material issues and prosperity as, as I moved to America, went to Princeton, went to University of Wisconsin in Madison got a PhD in fusion and discovered that I was useless. And you can hear a little bit more about that story if you talk on the Global Village construction set. So the last year of the, about 2004, I coined the concept of open source ecology. And what really motivated me, motivated me to do that is that I thought about the power of open collaboration. And I noticed that even in my research program, I could not talk openly about my work to other people because we had some hot material and just couldn't. And I thought, wow, that's such a waste. Uh, what am I doing here? It's supposed to be an institution of open learning, yet we're protecting ourselves and not really collaborating. And I thought, well, can we do better? Can we solve all issues, solve world pressing issues faster than they're created? by truly collaborating. So building upon open source, open source hardware, came up with the concept of open source ecology, which refers to an integration of, of a harmonious existence of human and natural ecosystems 
along the lines of the open source model towards creating an open society and open source economy. Moved out to some land in the middle of Missouri, nowhere Missouri, beautiful nowhere Missouri, and began to build. So as of 2011, we had eight different prototypes, the tractor, brick press, power cube, some other ones, torch table, iron worker, micro truck, and kept building uh, so that you, see, you can see here in 2011, the TED Talk hit, did a lot of prototyping. Right now, we're at about 120. This is a little old here. This is until 2013. But we've so far built about 18 unique prototypes. There's four that are recommended for replication, like the brick press, the power cube, the salt pulverizer. The tractor is close. We're going to look to release that next year. Uh, but a lot of different machines, constant progress. But but we're only, I would say, about 25% done. There's been two dozen replications in seven countries around the world of the different machines. There, there have been 12 replications of the brick press, the farthest developed machine. Now, this is the first one. So, so the first milestone of the project was that people can actually replicate the work. So at one time, this guy sent me this picture, which I thought was a Photoshop copy of, of the machine. But that's the real machine. He just downloaded the plants and built the machine from scratch without even contacting, contacting me. It was transparent enough that replication can happen. So, that, so we have achieved some replications, such as in the, another in the United States, another power cube in the United States. There was a tractor build in. California by some high school students, a tractor build in Guatemala at a sugar refinery, sugar plantation rather, a brick press built in Italy, one in China even for an art show in Turkey, another brick press that was taken to Africa, another one in Texas. This is a guy building, guy building a house currently, one of our friends in Texas who's built the machine. And this is perhaps the best example of, of um, what can happen. So here what appears to be two of our brick presses and four power cubes in a production facility, a brick production facility in Nicaragua. So this I got out of the blue from one supporter. I didn't know this was even happening. And we're trying to follow up to find out who that is because we'd like to get the feedback on what, what's working, how it's working, and so forth. As a global project, we get feedback and collaboration on our wiki. That's where it starts. That's uh, the house that was apparently built with a brick press. This is in Nicaragua. OK, so another ma major milestone. What we do with all our work is to make our production processes extremely efficient. We document all of that. So we're able to build our machines using a large parallel team. Due to module-based design, we can make the multiple modules in parallel and then assemble them rapidly into place. And using IKEA-style fabrication diagrams, we can do things effectively, such that a team of 12 people can build such a machine in a single day. So that's a great accomplishment. But it's very important because we're trying to create a different way of, of building things in, in the world, real products. And that means you have to be efficient. So in order to compete with modern industrial efficiency, we're, we're creating collaborative processes can get involved hands on. So is everything OK with the sound? Can you hear me on everything? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. OK, great. So I'll continue. But just a little more about the machine, for example, here. It costs $5,000 in materials. It's an automated brick press that presses earth blocks from plain clay soil. It can be stabilized those amend to make them waterproof. But the machine here uh, puts out about 5,000 bricks in a single day, enough for a small house. And if you were to buy this machine elsewhere, it would cost you about, about $50,000 for a machine of the same throughput. So there's a definite economic advantage to doing that. And we can sell these things and generate revenue that way. And that's how we're trying to do it right now by running work production slash education workshops where we can both produce and train people in one as our operating model. 
So the third point about our work is the radical modularity. We're really trying to create something like a construction set, like a Lego set for real hardware. And you can see like in the tractor, it's got the box beam tubing, which is very modular. We've got interchangeable power units like the power cube, the universal rotors, which are the wheels. They simply readily and as many interchangeable, interchangeable parts as possible to make reconfiguration feasible. So, so for example, the power cubes can interchange. The tubing that we use can be used for other purposes, such as building CNC torch tables or an iron worker machine, which is used to cut slabs of steel. Thing we built, this one here. Basically the same construction, uh, bolts uh, and tubing, plates. This is a universal rotor, which can be used in an application of a, a trencher. And the same, same exact rotor is used on the wheels of the tractor. We have multi-purpose parts that can be repurposed to many different things so that that rotor can be also used as a rototiller or a supersized string trimmer or even a honey extractor if you want. By using this modular construction technique, we were able to reduce prototyping for months to days, which is a, a great feat if you want to do rapid prototyping and, and develop a lot of different machines quickly. And here's a great example. The first iron worker, which is once again a device that can shear slabs of steel like one by ten inches. We built the blue one on the left hand side here over a period of six months. And after doing going through that, it, we said to ourselves, wow, that takes a lot of time. This is not really replicable. It just takes too much time to build it. So we decided to strip down all the complexity, use our modular tubing, and we built the machine on the right hand side there, which is a machine that can also shear one by ten steel. Um, and we did that with two people in 24 hours. So by radically stripping down the design, think about what's the absolute critical components, we were able to set to build extremely rapidly. Or this backhoe that we built, which was built in two weeks, designed and built in two weeks and tested with two people. So we work on a construction set approach where we don't just build one item, but build, like for the tractor, we build a, a, a set that can be used to build a tractor in one case, a bulldozer in another, a backhoe in another, a trencher. We can reconfigure these things to, to be multi-purpose. And we think that kind of approach applies not only to hardware, like mechanical hardware, but also to electronics, to renewable energy equipment, anything else that you want to apply that to, or heavy machining. So design a construction set which allows people way more flexibility, allows people to reconfigure it, and puts the technology into people's hands. So that's the idea. And we also achieved real-time documentation in, the whole, in this whole process, where, when, for example, when we were building the iron worker machine, we had a team of people listening onto that on a Google Hangout, just like we are right now. They were observing what we were doing. We were speaking to them. We were uploading pictures and actually videos. And by the end of the build, a remote team has produced a, an instructional step-by-step step, as well as a video the next day. So we've achieved real-time documentation because the issue is a lot of times information gets lost so you want to be able to document it in real time as much as possible. So that goes, uh, next step is our next milestone how we're funding the project like right now is by running extreme manufacturing workshops. So these are our build events, rapid build events which in which for example we can build the brick press over a weekend because we can build it by itself in a single day. We combine a little bit of training and welding, custom fabrication, metal, metal work, and we go, let people go at it. And people typically find that they learn skills rapidly in this kind of immersion environment, and it works. We are able to take an unskilled team of people, provide some basic skills, and by using basic design, uh, people are able to do meaningful work. Uh, basically industrial production on a, on a community scale. So we'd like to expand this model to, to the micro factory, which is a multi-purpose production center for flexible fabrication where you can just build, build just about anything within your local community. So imagine you have all the different designs that you can download from the internet and produce just about anything 
at the local scale so that uh, you can re empower local economies. And if you build things yourself, that also means that that you can maintain them for a lifetime. So it also has lifetime design issues involved here. And th that's the model that we're trying to scale. Just like now we're getting into housing, we're finding out that these kinds of techniques, you can take a lot of people working in parallel. As long as you design the process to work in parallel, you can have as many people as you like be involved in this kind of an event process. So to give you some numbers, when we did the brick press build, uh, we generated $10,000 of revenue. We sold the machine at a 5,000 profit, and we took tuition from participants such that we're able to generate decent revenue. And, and we're hoping that others can replicate this kind of work, for which reason we're creating an immersion training program starting next year. I mean, one of the disappointments was that nobody's really replicating this stuff. Um, it's hard. It takes a lot of skill set in terms of organization, in terms of hands-on skills, or and and uh, people are not replicating the stuff. It's I mean it's hard enough that the the uptake is not really happening, and hence our reason to go into the immersion training as our way to deliberately put people out there into the world that are building open source hardware, doing that as a livelihood, not just as a pastime but something that they can make base their life out of it uh, so that we create a better world of distributed power, distributed economic power. So here's a little bit of when we do, for example, this was back from a build when we were doing a build of the house. We lay out the workflow very carefully, get our machines working, a lot of people in parallel as you see here. We also incorporate um, modules like these roof modules when we build our structures. So that's structure built using our bricks and some standard construction methods. Here's our first micro house built with a brick press. It's actually made of brick with a wood siding. This is this expanded once we added to this micro house. That's actually the core of that. And then we added onto it two more modules and continued adding. That's the, it's like the extreme extreme swarming method like the Amish have used for a long time. But our model is um, what we'd like to do is have a small core of people running a global development effort, kind of like, like your Linux Foundation, which is a very small team of people that runs, that generates a billion dollars worth of contributions per year uh, in terms of software. We'd like to do that for hardware, uh, create a platform for doing that. And the main reason here is to address this question of 85 equals 3.5 billion. That is, 85 of the richest people own as much wealth as the 3.5 billion at the bottom of the pyramid. That's not nice. This figure is actually getting worse. It was like 60 or so um, last year. So this is actually getting worse. The point is to distribute economic power, to distribute wealth while we can produce anything in this world today. We're not distributing. There's a lot of people left behind. So we want to address that issue. We want to address the issue of, of genuine progress uh, happening better. So as, as we grow our domestic product, measures of quality of life are not really increasing. So we've got issues that we want to address. Now, with the power of the small-scale manufacturing like we're trying to do to develop, enable local micro factories, uh, we, we, we create a lot of power for the people. And it's, it's extremely empowering to see that you can do this on a, on a small scale with your own hands. It's a very empowering experience. And, a, and the purpose is so that we free ourselves from material constraints. Like my, my quote on freedom is that the deepest kind of freedom comes when each and every one of us can tap those abundant resources around us to free ourselves from material constraints. Can focus on what's more important to us rather than just trying to make a living. And what is more important to us? Well, self-determination theory, as popularized by Daniel Pink in his surprising uh, Science of Motivation TED Talk, says that it's not a fat carrot on a stick that drives us, but much more fundamental human needs of autonomy, mastery, and purpose, which drive us, and whether we know it or not. So what, what is a meaningful life for us? We want to open that up so that everyone pur pursues their passion and dreams rather than trying to make a living. So we have long, 
lot of long-term goals to create the open source economy within 20 years. Um, I can show you, I can send you a link to the OSC roadmap. We have a 20-year roadmap of basically developing the enabling hardware tools and developing various enterprises around that towards ending artificial scarcity, towards ending resource conflicts at the end of the day with the open source economy. So that pretty much wraps up the uh, presentation. I, I will um, talk about this one slide here. I like this one. It's, it's about the open source development method in that open source has already happened during the first industrial revolution and it has shown that better results in terms of innovation can happen. So this graph is actually showing the efficiency of steam engines back in the first industrial revolution when, when Watt's patent was around. You see the, the efficiency as a function of time on this graph. And when Watt was around and his patent expired, there were people that took, took the designs and started to, to innovate. They published a journal and they didn't have a wiki back then, so they published a paper journal and the innovation in terms of the increase of steam engine efficiency shot up. It went up significantly, statistically measurable. And this is not a freak event here. If you study this event in history, you can see that because the innovation was unleashed at that particular point about like uh, 1800 when Watt's patent expired, uh, things happened towards, towards the better in terms of innovation. So we know that open source can work, that collaboration does work, and it's a paradigm that we're trying to make more popular and bring it into the, the mainstream economy. But even with that, I mean, of course, your Google and Apple today, did you know that they spend more on patents than on research and development? So that tells you that there's some waste going on. What if we could really innovate openly? we could unleash innovation. I mean, we think that innovation is amazing today, but I think it could be way better. I think we're in fact in the dark ages because people don't collaborate. People consistently reinvent the wheel and uh, instead of working openly. So I think at this point, I'll transition us on to, to Katarina here uh, and we'll, we'll talk about the Open Building Institute and what is the deal about <laughs> the Open Building Institute? It's, a, it's essentially a culmination of or application of all the work we've done today. We've built machines, we've built houses, we've built production machines, and we're putting that together to a product that people can understand, a house, an ecological house with an aquaponic greenhouse. It's, um, while nobody really wants a tractor in a city or understands what that is, everyone wants a house. It's a, it's a product that is very important, and in fact, it's the single largest expense in people's lives, so we're t tackling that because housing is unaffordable. And did you know that in America, an average person, average American, spends $1.2 million over their lifetime just to secure a home? That's a lot of money. And most people end up getting in, in debt and our goal is to make affordable, ecological, open source, modular, expandable eco-housing. And Katrina is going to lead the world <laughs> in that adventure. Hi again. Uh, OK, so I will go very quiet. Before we move on, um, I think uh, there is a, a few questions uh, there there that a question. might be yeah, relevant certainly. for the open source ecology topic. Um, so yeah, yeah. I mean, especially Jovan is very interested about the fact that you are using um, standalone parts for building the hardware. What about the software, yeah. like the, the the power brake or the the, the, um, the brick press, etc.? Do you use uh, standard protocols to allow people to control those machines with existing software and maybe open source software? Absolutely, as much as possible. I mean, for example, the only issues in terms of the machines is the control code, for example. For, well, there's some CNC machines, but for the brick press, we use control code. Of course, it's on an Arduino platform, and it's open source, so we want to absolutely go with the free and open source software so that the person has full control over their, their content. And of course, with projects, if we build the 3D printer or the CNC torch table that we've built, we use Linux CNC, for example. 
on the 3D printers, of course, we use the tool chain from the RepRap project and build as much as possible on what's out there. So software is a big part, and uh, we do the standard standard open source on that. We're, we're very strict about that so that everything is open to software whole levels. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And I guess you're always listening to, to feedback regarding uh, suggestions of what uh, protocols or what standards might make more sense than others. I mean, the way you, you presented it, right, you, are, you guys are looking for uh, domain experts that are basically advising on what's, uh, what are the best practices and you're always looking for um, yeah, the, best, the best options out there. Exactly. And just to add to that, we work with Aquaponics Lab, which is an open source aquaponics group from the UK. It's their water elf internet of things monitor. It was for temperature, for humidity, and other things. Um, but that's we've been working with them and we want to do the next iteration of that. We're continue gonna continue working with them on the next iteration of of the water, pH, dissolved oxygen, automatic fish feeding, perhaps automatic pH correction. So, so sensing and monitoring of the greenhouse environment, that's, that's important. But on a much more practical level, so we use the wiki as primarily plat primary platform, but as far as setting up the whole organization, I mean, we're pretty much reworking all of that, starting with uh, your email lists and project management and all of that. The whole collaboration infrastructure needs to, needs to happen still. I mean, we're, I would say that's it's kind of like a weak point of the organization right now, we revamp that, and we certainly want to want to get people involved in that and restart our forums. I mean, our forums kind of been unmanaged for some time, so we want to do all of these upgrades, and we definitely would invite people who are familiar with with MediaWiki, with WordPress, um, with other topics like like for the wiki, like semantic media wiki or just template creation and many other things in the project. Like open source video editing, we're just getting into FreeCAD with uh, open source uh, CAD design. There's Sweet Home 3D that we use as our open source design for the homes. But yeah, uh, we definitely uh, could use assistance from people with best practices. Mm -hmm. Okay, so hopefully uh, some of our viewers will uh, We'll be jumping in and, and, and volunteering to help. Um, so yeah, Katarina, why don't you move on to, to the Open Building Institute? And for everyone uh, watching the webinar, remember to ask questions using the virtual IoT hashtag. My impression is that the comments on meetup.com uh, are not really working today. So yeah, please use Twitter instead mm -hmm. uh, or just um, comment over um, using the YouTube comments. OK. Yeah, I mean, please feel free to chime in at any moment. Louder. So, uh, please feel free to chime in at any moment. I'm just going to go uh, very briefly over um, the core aspects of the Open Building Institute and how we got there. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to talk a little bit more about the greenhouse and IoT, right, in that mm -hmm. context. Okay. So, let me just, can you share? So, we want to do this one. The yeah, can you share the screen? Uh huh. So we're going back to. Share the screen and then go to infographic. And present. OK, so um, the Open Building Institute, like many other um, most other open source projects started from had a had a mother and a father and the parents were first work that was previously done. Uh, what Martin talked about uh, all the the not just technologies, but even the approach to developing technology that Martin and uh, his team has been working on for, for a very long time, but also from a personal need. Uh, so we got married in late 2013 and moved to uh, this farm, or I moved here, Martin was already here, in, a, in the winter, in the very, very cold winter of uh, 2014, if I'm not mistaken. And we had a tiny, tiny house. It was 144 square feet. And what we, what we found out is like, while that is OK for one person, it's very complicated for two people, especially as it, when, when it has to double as a workspace. 
So we had this problem. We needed to build a house. We needed to do it fast. And it, we needed to do it cheaply. And we couldn't spend uh, too much of our time on it because we had other things to do. So uh, we thought about it, and what we realized is OSC had already put in place a lot of the pieces we needed to actually do this. And of course, we looked around and found out that there wasn't a single like, fully packaged solution that would just solve our problems. So we had to actually put a lot of work into it. And that's how, you know, we didn't call it the Open Building Institute at the time, but that's how it all started. So. Uh, Throughout the last two years, uh, as Martin actually already alluded to, we've been experimenting and developing this approach. Uh, at the same time that we are building uh, here at the farm, both as a way to uh, test the concepts and also as a way to provide infrastructure to our projects. So at the core of this idea of the Open Building Institute or open source housing is a library of modules. And this concept is once again derived not only from uh, what is, what's, you know, modular architecture, which has been around for a very long time, but also from uh, OSC's approach to modularity. So basically, we broke down the components of a house into these boxes that can just be put together, like a little bit like Legos. So they are just like the walls are basically placed next to each other. Uh, and what we found out is that this is a lot easier and a lot faster. So I'm a, I'm a small woman without, you know, who until two years ago had never built a house or anything like it. And these days I can build a small studio almost by myself with minor help. So this really, really lowers the barriers. Um, now, when I talk about the library, I'm talking about 3D models, about designs. But there was still a little bit of a barrier there because how do you design a house from these modules? And so, of course, we went to uh, open source software. And uh, you probably, some, many of you might be familiar with a, a free and open source application called Sweet Home 3D, which was just perfect for this. So basically, we just took advantage of all the functionalities already existing in this fantastic project and created a library for it. So right now, you can go on the Open Building Institute website, download this library, and use these these, these models to design a house. Uh, we're still working on adding more instructionals for that, but it's already uh, definitely feasible, and that's exactly the software that we use to design our buildings. Um, so basically, we, the, the, the system right now is almost bare bones. We have a few different types of uh, uh, doors and a few different types of walls and windows and roof modules, it is going to grow. But even with these basic modules, there, there is a big variety of things that you can design. They can be small or quaint, they can be bigger, uh, they can be modern or more traditional. So the idea is to create a language for designing houses uh, that is accessible to everyone. So here are just a couple examples that I modeled very quickly, again, in Sweet Home 3D. Um, now, yes, yeah, so here's an example of how the modules actually go together. It's quite simple. So this is the same process that you use to design it. It's the same process that you use to build it. You just build these modules and you place them next to each other. Um, now, this is another very important aspect of the project, which is we do want to focus on eco-housing and local materials and off-grid applications because um, not only we understand that this is one, also one of the big costs in addition to mortgage of rent, one of the big costs of housing, but also because at this point there really is no reason for us not to be using more local materials than we currently do in the construction industry. And maybe Martin, do you want to talk a little bit about the technologies included in the project? Just and briefly. We do have a Part of the project is an open source materials production facility to be built next year, but in it we will have the stabilized compressed earth block production. We will have lumber production using an open source sawmill. We will have multi-wall polycarbonate gl glazing, 3D printed from scrap plastic using an open source large format 3D printer. We're going to have continuous lime burning to make lime concrete, which you can use for foundations or you can use to stabilize your block. We're going to have biofiber insulation, which is basically biomass or newspaper uh, or plants shredded up into a powder 
to make insulation. It's like blown cellulose insulation. And the last thing would be paints, which uh, why paints? Because a five gallon bucket of exterior paint is $100. That's a lot of money for materials that are maybe a few dollars of materials. Um, so those are all the materials that we're going to produce in a facility that's going to be solar powered. So it can be run completely from the off the grid. The other part of there is, is actually the pellet production, both pellets for fuel pellets and charcoal pellets, which are burned, uh, partly burned wood to make charcoal, which could be used as fuel for our gasifiers. Like we run our first gasifier last year, so we can power our tractors and machines with, with wood pellets or charcoal pellets. Charcoal can also be used for water purification systems that are within the house, or they can be used to fertilize the soil. Uh, carbon carbon in, back in the soils for carbon sequestration. So that's a brief overview of the materials production facility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I mean, uh, w one thing that you mentioned briefly is that we're also uh, working towards making the houses as self-sufficient as possible in terms of power and other utilities, so including water catchment and photovoltaics and all of that. Yeah, right. So a lot of extreme features but I want to just summarize the main point here that to me is extremely important and that is, well, Katarina will expand on it, but in, in one sentence we have learned how to build a small expandable starter home, say about seven or eight hundred square feet, for under twenty-five thousand dollars in materials that are loaded with ecological features and which can be built in five days using local materials. So all our learning to date has resulted in that package and because of its efficiency we think we can have significant penetration into the the world of construction. And that's that's our idea. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Katarina and we have we have go a ahead. question from we have a question about yeah, it. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Uh, the question is, how do you compare um, what you guys do with other initiatives like, uh, namely, uh, WikiHouse, for example? What, uh, what would be the, the main differences? Okay, so uh, first of all, let me talk about the commonalities, which is we love WikiHouse. Uh, Alistair Parvin, who is one of the founders of WikiHouse, is well, actually one of the Open Building Institute's advisors. We check in regularly, we try to work together as much as possible, and we very, very much align philosophically and in terms of the end goal. So the only differences between uh, Open Building Institute system and WikiHouse are uh, technical. So WikiHouse uses uh, structural panels that are notched using a CNC mill and then uh, fit it together. We use uh, standard materials that don't require um, as much precision. So we use off-the-shelf materials. Uh, and what I believe is that these two projects will be, both of them will be useful. If anything, we need more systems so that when it comes time to build something, anything, a house, a barn, a garage, you have all of these choices and you can choose, okay, I have a CNC mill and I have access to structural panels, I'll go with WikiHouse or no, I don't have those things, so I'll just use standard materials from the Open Building Institute and so on and so forth. So um, what we're trying to do, and actually we've been discussing this with, with WikiHouse, is try and form a coalition of projects to bring about open source housing. So the more the merrier. Does that answer the question? I guess it does. We Hello? will see if, if, if Alex <laughs> follows up with another question. Um, but uh, mm -hmm. at least uh, from my point of view, it's a very clear answer. Thank you. Okay. Uh, did you have another question? I don't see I don't see other questions at the moment. Uh, uh -huh. But uh, okay. yeah, if you if you guys are, are watching us right now, feel free to tweet using the virtual IoT hashtag or uh, uh, comment on YouTube, and we'll forward your questions to uh, Martin and Katarina. Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I'll just keep going through. Like the project is very, very complex, and uh, we are doing our best to communicate it. But the more we get involved in this, the more we realize that there are many parts that need to come together for this to actually be useful. So of course, one of them is that it's open source, and by that we mean anyone is free not just to use and fabricate, but also to sell. So this is this respects the open source uh, definition. 
and the free uh, software definition. So that is very, very important for us. We believe that it's not possible to revolutionize housing or even machinery production without it. Um, and then, of course, the fact that it's open source means that it's not just about us like sitting here and designing all of these things and putting them out there. Is It really is a mass collaboration. So we, are, we have a really amazing list of advisors who we rely on to teach us everything from uh, solar energy to code compliance to radical technologies or new technologies, um, sustainable building, et cetera, et cetera. So we are also relying on designers and volunteers around the world to help us expand the library and improve the library. By refining the modules is one way, but another way that is really important is by translating uh, this system into other locations. For example, like we're based in the US, so our system is in inches, right? It's imperial. Now, if someone wanted to use this in Europe, th this would not have to be translated to metrics. So that would be one really good way to get involved if you're interested. Um, now, the other thing is the simplicity. Again, like this is really important for us. These, this system, it needs, one of our principal requirements is not just that it's ecological and good and, you know, in quality, it also needs to be, it's also designed, the modules are designed to be easily and quickly built by amateurs. This needs to be accessible to everyone. So you can see here in this little animation just how simple a wall module is to build. Um, now we come to the social production, which Martin already talked uh, quite a bit about, and um, this is inspired, in a way, by traditional Amish practices in which neighbors would get together to build each other's barns. So everyone would work on their neighbor's barns, and they also get their barns built. So that's how we do it. Rather than, I mean, you can use the system and hire a crew to build the house for you, but our approach is to organize educational uh, events, which are workshops that have lectures and all of the, all, and, you know, everything you'd expect from a workshop, but during which a house is actually built. And uh, you already talked quite a bit about that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so maybe, uh, so this is, for example, one of our latest workshops, and this one took place in November. And we built an 800 square foot greenhouse in a total of six days. So on day one, we actually built the walls from raw materials, wall modules and installed them. On day two, we built the roof modules and installed them. And then we spent four days uh, creating two fish ponds and all the, the infrastructure, including IoT, which we'll talk a little bit about more about that later. Now we're hosting two more workshops this fall uh, in November again. So we are building a studio in early November and we're doing back-to-back -back workshops and building a second aquaponic greenhouse uh, right after that. If you go to openbuildinginstitute.org and check out the workshops page, that information will be there and registration is open right now. Or email us if you have any questions or suggestions about this. Um, so again, our approach is exactly what Martin talked about. We are just basically translating OSE's uh, approach to machine build into house build, which is people work in teams of two. Each team that two builds one, two or three more modules. And basically, uh, within a few hours, we have all the wall modules or roof modules ready, and they can just be installed. It's very, very fast. Uh, in, again, like in two days, we built an 800 square foot greenhouse. So it's it's shown that it actually works. So these are some numbers from the latest, uh, from this last uh, greenhouse workshop. You can read more about it on the website. And again, Martin also alluded to this. Now, one thing that is really, really important to us is debt-free housing. And how do you achieve debt-free housing? Um, Right now, if there are, there are some issues with the housing market because you only have two options and one of them is not exactly an option. So one of the, most of the houses on the market right now in the US will cost $360,000 and they're big houses, they're nice houses, but they mean that you would have to get in debt to get them. The alternative are very small houses which are still you know, struggling to get established but they're getting more and more popular but the problem is what happens 
if a couple moves into a, a tiny house and then they have children or they want to have a home office or their life changes somehow. I mean, I read an article or a couple articles recently about how many people abandon their tiny houses after one year just because they need to expand for some reason, because their life circumstances changed. So what we're betting everything on is on this idea that rather than having to choose between being stuck with a very small house forever, no matter what happens in your life, or having to get a huge mortgage to have a, a bigger house, you would do, we're doing incremental building. So you can start with a small house, which is what we did, and then you can keep adding to it. And the modular system is designed precisely to facilitate this. So our houses are designed so that they can be expandable however you need them to be. Um, so this is exactly what we did. Uh, again, we already talked this very briefly. We started in 2013 with a 144 square feet. Then we added a bedroom, a mudroom, and a porch. We added a living room and then an aquaponic greenhouse. Here are some photos. This is a photo from the original structure. It used compressors blocks and had a utility module, one of the first modules we developed. It was followed by a simple bedroom with a loft, also CBs. And then we added a mudroom because this is a farm and there's a lot of mud. Uh, and then we added a porch for uh, that had uh, allowed us passive solar heating in the summer. Uh, to that, we added then the biggest module to date, which is 800 square feet. And it includes a large workspace slash library, a second bathroom, an office, and a utility room. It has hydronic heated floor, which is the most comfortable form of heating we've ever experienced. Um, we were able to design it and do it ourselves for a fraction of commercial ones, and we'll never go back on hydraulic heating because it's fantastic. Uh, we also made sure that the water and electric channels are accessible, so we so the house is hackable, so we can actually add and remove and repair things. So that's really important to us as well. This in, this constant interaction with the building, this ownership and ability to repair. And then we added um, a giant aquaponic greenhouse, which do you want to talk about more about the systems, the IoT? Uh, if we have time, I don't know how we're doing on time. Uh, how much we're doing on time. So I mentioned what it, what we know. We use the Water Elf. Water Elf, is, it's called, from Aquaponics Lab. So um, aquaponicslab.org, I believe that is. Our friends there, Paolo and others, uh, are working on that. We're collaborating with them. Talk a little bit about just the setup, like what is pumped through the towers. The way, why do you need controls there? Well, there's issues on, on just basics of temperature. Like we have the hydronic heating, the same coils that run our subfloor heating. We extended those modularly into the greenhouse to heat our ponds in the winter so that there's tilapia fish and two large ponds. And we have 48 of these towers that you see here where water dribbles in from the top and leaks out the bottom back into the ponds. So the controls there are basically to turn the water on and off. You could, I mean, it's important to measure the temperature and humidity and get the data real time because we're, we're in a zone, we're in zone five here, but it gets down to negative 20 Fahrenheit. So you want to make sure you're on top of your temperature, your water temperature, your pHs, and dissolved oxygen in the tanks. So if we max out the productivity of this, the system here that we have, the 800 square feet, is designed to produce three pounds of fish per day. So that's pretty pretty interesting. And about a thousand, like in the towers, you can plant a thousand and harvest a thousand plants every month on a four-week growing cycle. So that's that's basically, and we have we have chickens in there as well they're in a separate separate room we've got other growing beds we're still going to add duckweed and azola uh, worm towers and uh, the goal for this year is actually to create a revenue generating model so that your house is not only producing food but you can also run a small business like a community supported agriculture where between the the greens and uh, microgreens and sprouts you can produce like two thousand dollars worth of produce per month so we're working on that revenue model that economic model and publishing that as we get experience so we're looking for a person to run that operation here um in the next year mm -hmm. or so that's the basics of the aquaponic greenhouse yeah 
So the workshop, we're going to build another one of these. We're building a, uh, basically a seed home, the one that's loaded with the ecological features. That's going to be a five-day build and another five-day build of this greenhouse structure like this. Uh, I think probably we're going to make that 800 square feet again. But yeah, we're just continuing prototyping, iteratively designing, making improvements on the whole system. Altogether, it worked pretty well. Uh, there's a lot of air gaps that we have to fix up in a in a greenhouse. That's one issue that we didn't resolve fully. But uh, otherwise, it's moving forward, and and we're trying to make it into a real viable product because nobody else is really creating this uh, this turnkey model, which also has proven economics built into it, so you can pay back for the structure quickly. Uh, the structure costs six thousand dollars, including all the systems. So if you're producing at two thousand dollars a month, that would be like a three-month payback time for building one of these greenhouses, which would be amazing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think we're more or less at the limit. Uh, Benjamin, do you do you have questions or? Yeah, there's and a just, there's a bunch of questions, bunch of questions uh, on the, uh, the, the, regarding the community. Regarding um, a question from Alex, is there lots of activity going on around open source ecology and the Open Building Institute uh, in Asia and in China in particular? Um, Alex is looking at uh, uh, helping uh, build open source villages there. Uh, so, well, I guess, I mean, maybe you can sh shed some light on whether um, there is a community there indeed, and maybe you guys can also take, take that offline afterwards. Right. Well, I mean, we're working with people all over the world, and we're receiving um, so many emails and other like supportive messages from people all over the world who are interested. Uh, we still need to get it together enough to be able to do a map of collaborators. But one of the what we just took a very very simple step towards allowing people to find each other, which is we created a Facebook group anyone can post to. And the idea is precisely for people to actually find their neighbors or find people who are working on something parallel without necessarily having to go through us. So uh, if we switch to the, to the, how do we stop the screen share? I can post, we can post the link to that. Um, oh, we would have to do it. We can post it on the YouTube video right after this and yep. um, also mailing list. But pro the answer is probably we're not sure. Unless you have more specific yeah. yes. uh, okay. information. No, I mean, the chapters work. It's also one of those things that you really need a full time staff person to manage that. I mean, yeah. we just don't have the time to do that. We collaborate. The way we work is typically collaborating with people on active projects. Mm -hmm. And uh, But we have a lot of work to do in terms of the, the collaboration infrastructure and something. You know, yeah, maybe talked about that. Uh, well, I think the Facebook page is a very good idea. Um, there is a um, another um, yeah, similar question slash comment. Um, I think Jovan really liked the idea of having uh, modules in um, and, and a library for Sweetum 3D and basically having um, yeah, models for all the modules. But is there a platform? So could it be Google Maps? Could it be Facebook? I don't know, but a platform for helping connect the people in need of modules with the people who have the machines that can actually produce the, the, the module and who have the CNCs, et cetera, et cetera. So there, maybe uh, Facebook can help or Google Maps, I, I don't know. Well, I mean, the Facebook group will uh, probably be the lowest, uh, the simplest tool for that uh, at the moment. But what I would also like to point out is that although we are making a big push towards the local production of materials, the materials production facility. Uh, we understand and, and we understand that it's going to be a little bit until that ripples around the world and everyone has one in their neighborhood. So the open source and modular nature of the system also means that you can do the same modules with box with uh, store bought materials. So mm -hmm. there is no reason why this couldn't be true. If you really can't find uh, the machine or the materials, you can always get standard materials. But yes, it would be great if people started connecting and um, working together to find the machines and the materials locally. Part of the program in the next two years is to develop a robust platform for development and documentation. That's one of the big ticket items that we have to work out to, in terms of a collaboration architecture for how exactly this happens. 
effectively to leverage the whole world in collaborating, including things like design challenges, which we will, we mm -hmm. will offer. Yeah. So that's a huge question, the development design platform. Yeah. And it's part of the, so by the way, we're, we are running a Kickstarter right now for seed funding of this project and the development platform is part of the, part of the steps. So we're, we're promoting, here's the library so that you can design yourself. Here's a training program for builders where you can builder wherever you are. Third is the open source materials production facility. And fourth is the big collaboration platform that everyone can work together on. Mm -hmm. Yep. That makes sense. Um, I think we are running out of questions and of time. Uh, there actually were lots of questions, so I wouldn't be surprised if people also uh, send questions um, while watching the replay. So if you are watching the replay, uh, just comment on YouTube and we will make sure to forward your, your questions to, to Marcin and, and Katarina. Um, I think we will be back for another virtual IoT in the first week of August. We still need to, to finalize on the date. Uh, it will very likely be around uh, the Open Connectivity Foundation and uh, IoTVT. Uh, it still needs to be confirmed, but stay tuned for, for the announcement. Um, the one after next is probably going to be in September. We need to get some rest at some point. Uh, we were very happy to have uh, Marcin and Katarina. Uh, guys, you shared lots of uh, well slides and lots of links. So we will make sure to um, to share that with, with the group uh, in, the, in the comments on, on Meetup, on YouTube. And if you guys uh, share the links to the, um, the link to the slides, that would be great as well. Um, the Kickstarter, I think, is something, uh, as you mentioned, that people may want to, to, to have a quick look at. How are you guys uh, doing? Uh, like, uh, how far are you? Uh, how many days are remaining? And how far are you from reaching the goal? Oops, I think we lost um, our speakers. So that's time, I guess, to say, to say goodbye. We'll talk again in two weeks' time. Bye, take care.